First of all, uh, all right, now it's sort of Thank you very much for the invitation. I think uh, as last time in Zurich, very cool place here uh, from a cultural perspective, not so much from a temperature perspective, of course, <laughs> but uh, I think um, we will get that done. Uh, my name is Wolfgang Meyer. I'm a uh, head of the hardware development um, team in the IBM Research and Development Lab in Böblingen. My team is about 300 engineers, um, mostly uh, logic designers. And um, we heard about Power8 a little bit and uh, the significant design um, components of the Power8 actually are developed in, uh, in my team. So, um, uh, sometimes it's not that well known that uh, a lot of process development uh, is still done here in, in, uh, in Germany since, uh, of course, Intel uh, has most of their um, development teams sitting uh, in the US. Um, what I want to do today, I want to talk a little bit about Power8, I want to talk a little bit about hardware technology in common, not only Power8. Uh, and um, as we have heard before, um, uh, I listened to the presentation and um, there were two parts. The first part was about the spread street uh, stuff and the roadmap. And then there was the, what the uh, developer called the fancy stuff, of course. And uh, pretty much when I uh, hear uh, Sophia guys talking about the fancy stuff, there is a kind of alarm bell ringing in myself because this means, uh, ah, these guys need more performance in the future uh, as usual, okay? <laughs> and uh, now, um, if uh, we really want to deliver more performance, we have to think a little bit about Moore's Law. Um, this is uh, what I want to start with, because I think when we look at the uh, last um, 30 years or so, performance was not a big issue. And the reason for that was um, we had uh, very uh, huge steps forward in uh, semiconductor technology. Um, Gordon Moore um, did a bold statement in the 1960s, uh, which said, okay, uh, within uh, the next decades, we can raise performance every two years by a factor of two. Uh, and I think uh, in his equation, the first uh, thing he was uh, focusing on was number of transistors on a chip. Uh, I think um, when we look at the projection, um, Moore's law pretty much uh, was fulfilled almost perfectly over 40 years now, or almost 50 years. Uh, but um, I think what uh, Gordon Moore um, really meant, or how the Moore's law is interpreted, it's, it's not only about the technical stuff, it's also about the economical stuff. This means um, we can uh, produce more performance actually for more or less the same price um, relation as we had it in the in the almost in the 60s, and uh, I think uh, if uh, we could not resolve this equation in that way, the complete complete uh, digital development of the last uh, 30 40 years would not have been possible because we couldn't have uh, afforded it. That's um, I think what we should keep in mind. Um, so um, that's also why I, I picked this one uh, and, and called it Moore's law. What we see here. Uh, more or less uh, pretty much since the 1950s, um, we could uh, lower the cost uh, of uh, a single calculation more or less um, and uh, divide it by two every two years. Uh, this means today when we talk about petaflops or, or uh, um, big number of flops actually, uh, then uh, this was only possible because we had all this development. Okay? Now, uh, as a hardware developer, looking at that a little bit closer, uh, what we see is the patterns have changed over the last um, five to six years. Um, since um, besides the number of transistors we had on that hardware, uh, the uh, other uh, strong source of performance actually had been frequency. Uh, frequency, um, there had been another law which is not that popular, it's uh, the so-called Denner law. Frequency could be raised because with the smaller transistors, actually the power consumption of these transistors also um, uh, declined. Um, now, as we are so far down in the atoms already, um, okay, I have to get closer to that. As we are so far down in the atoms, um, we could not raise frequency uh, that much over the last five to ten years. Uh, the reason for that is that there is a 
pretty strong dependency between power consumption and frequency. And uh, more or less with frequency, we, are, we have arrived to break even something like five years ago. Uh, and what you see is, of course, Intel um, is interpreting that in a little bit different than, way than we do. We have some special technologies, but more or less between three and five gigahertz uh, is uh, where we uh, have to more or less give up on the frequency level. Okay? And this means when we um, want to allow a development like this and raise performance and pretty much support all your creativity in the future, we have to rethink a little bit uh, how we can produce performance uh, so that this equation will stay alive. Because if this equation is not alive, then the affordability of all the things which we call big data and all the other hype uh, is much more difficult than uh, we'd like to have that. Okay? And uh, what I want to do today a little bit is um, to demonstrate and show some uh, features, some uh, thoughts, uh, share some thoughts on uh, how we can uh, catch up with, equation, with this equation also in the future and what uh, power, the power technology and IBM, of course, is doing in order to do that. So now one thing is what we see here. This is uh, still a technology feature, okay? Uh, so far, the, the main driver always was uh, semiconductor technology, and the question is, can semiconductor technology not contribute anymore uh, to performance uh, improvements or to cost performance improvements? Uh, and the uh, answer is, well, there are still some features which um, um, can help here, and this is a typical one of that. As we um, cannot raise frequency, we go towards parallelization. Okay? This means you have all seen this trend. Uh, we go from uh, double core to eight core to 12 core designs. This uh, will also um, continue for a certain while because we still have uh, lithography actually, which allows us to put more transistors on the chip. Um, but in order to make um, more cores on the chip also efficient, uh, you have to build an infrastructure on the chips which helps you to uh, get these uh, um, to, to get these engines really uh, in the mode where they can work efficiently. And one uh, very important part in that is uh, that you have uh, cache structures on the chip, uh, stage uh, cache structure, structures actually, and big cache structures. Okay? And what we see here is a technology which allows you uh, to build much bigger caches actually on your chip. And uh, as we, still, we will see later on a little bit, uh, of course, uh, Power8, for example, is very famous for its big cache structures. Now, that doesn't come by, by itself. This comes by this technology. And uh, this technology is something we do especially uh, for our chips. It's called Deep Trench. And, uh, it works in that way uh, that usually, uh, in order to realize cache structures on a chip, we use so-called SRAM cells, and SRAM cells consume something like six transistors, okay? Um, now, what we found out is, uh, if you are capable to build a relatively high capacity on a chip, you can also uh, build a cell which consumes uh, just two uh, transistors, and so-called so DRAM cell. Um, DRAM technology is used in memory. So far, it was not possible to integrate that directly into the chip with this technology is possible. And what you do is, um, deep trench means you, you etch a relatively deep hole into the, process, into the uh, silicon. And with this deep hole, you are capable to build a high capacity. Okay? You blow some metal dust into that and you have a perfect capacitor. And this means this allows you uh, to build uh, these two uh, transistor um, DRAM cells on the chip, and this uh, means you get a cache density which is a factor three uh, compared to SRAM cell. And as, as we will see later on um, in the comparison, this allows us to build these extremely high caches uh, or big caches. Now, of course, uh, usually in these equations, uh, sometimes there is a burden you have to, to pay for it. The burden in this case is the etching process in order to burn the hole takes something like six weeks. Uh, since, I mean, it's just four micrometer, but four micrometer is a relatively deep hole in a, in a processor, okay? So this six weeks, of course, is something uh, which you miss in your development cycle. And as we, of course, all struggle with time to market, um, this is something which speci specifically we as uh, developers, of course, uh, uh, we love to have the big caches, but we hate uh, to pay six weeks for it, actually, in our development cycle. So that's, that's the equation around here. Then, of course, another thing is um, you need big caches, but um, as we have so much traffic, I mean, we have a superscalar out-of-order architecture on these chips now, 
uh, with a multi-course, you can imagine um, it's not quite simple uh, to exchange all the data in between. Um, this morning when I pretty much uh, traveled from Stuttgart to um, um, Nuremberg, um, yeah, I got a, a proof uh, again on uh, what it means to have congestion on the Autobahn uh, in this case. I mean, you have a similar situation in a, in a processor today, okay? Uh, you have several cores. Uh, all these cores have uh, a lot of uh, different units. And uh, there are a lot of uh, guys actually who want to uh, run their threads through this course, since we do, as we see later, we also do simultaneous multi-threading. And of course, it's in, in, uh, extremely important um, to have uh, uh, infrastructure in place, buses in place, uh, which allows you to keep these things efficient. And this is also a difference actually, which we have compared to other uh, chip um, uh, producers. Uh, we use another stack actually. Um, what you can see on the left side, uh, this is pretty much an a, a electron uh, scan microscope uh, of a, a chip which we have cut in the middle. And you see there are 15 layers of metal and um, pretty much down in the silicon today we have something like 4 billion transistors. And of course the more layers you have and the faster um, connections you have, the more efficient you can uh, connect these transistors with one another. And we have uh, uh, special uh, copper layers in there, also the stacked uh, layers um, and the number of layers, 50 metal layers is much higher than with other vendors. And we will look at uh, performance later on a little bit. Uh, as we heard before, Power8 is showing pretty good performance numbers. That does not mean that Intel doesn't, okay? And we, I try to explain a little bit what the difference is. Uh, but this is also one of the technology reasons why we still can uh, uh, get into this uh, good performance numbers. Okay, then uh, what I mentioned before, of course, um, is we get more parallel. Okay, uh, this means when you look at a usual processor, well, at a, at a Power 8 core specifically, because what we build is, these are really heavy load cores, okay? These are not uh, any low power, fancy <coughs> stuff. Actually, we build big machines, okay? Uh, that's, that's our goal, and that's uh, pretty much, uh, it does not mean that a big machine always is better than a small machine, but that's what, how we understand our business, okay? Now, usually uh, when you, when you run this uh, mighty cores, of course they consume a little bit more power, we see that uh, later on, uh, but usually uh, with today's um, um, uh, implementations of software where we do not take a lot of uh, uh, emphasis on parallelization, um, it's pretty difficult to completely utilize the complete core. Okay, this means when you look at the picture uh, in, this, in, a, in a regular uh, processor core we have uh, high number of uh, different units. And uh, when you run uh, actually a thread through this, uh, a software thread through this unit, then uh, mostly uh, only a, a small number of these units really is utilized. The other part is more or less waiting uh, till the other guys actually are getting done with their stuff and then they get into play again with the next cycle. Okay, that's uh, um, how it usually works. Now, of course, I mean, pretty simple. The question is why don't we utilize these resources? Um, and um, um, most of the processor um, vendors actually do that. Meanwhile, it's called hyperthreading with Intel. With Intel, we call it uh, simultaneous multi-threading. This means now you implement also a supervision uh, logic actually, which is watching uh, several threads, which we throw on the score in parallel, okay? Um, and this is what you see on the right side. Um, you have a blue thread and you have a, a red thread. Uh, and uh, you can run these things in parallel. Now, of course, um, sounds very simple um, um, and uh, for sure it's the right thing to do uh, if you want to support these parallel structures, but as a user you have to uh, use a feature like that a little bit more carefully than the things before, which we have heard before. Big caches, I mean, you don't have to take a lot of uh, um, um, into regard when you write your software. When you want to exploit a feature like that in the right way, you have to, okay? Because uh, it does not fit into every workload approach. It only fits if parallelization fits to the workload. Uh, and um, it's also uh, something um, which uh, has to be kind of balanced uh, in regard to the configuration, cache sizes, memory sizes, and to the specific workload. Let me give an example. 
Um, we had a POC running with a Yandex. Yandex is a, a huge uh, Russian search engine, pretty much the um, counterpart to Google in the more Kirillian letters uh, space. Um, and uh, they started uh, to work with Power8 on their own and uh, were a little bit disappointed actually at the beginning uh, to, of course, they could not really figure the sweet spot for, for example, simultaneous multi-thread. Okay, so we did some POC. They had to do some adjustments in their code. And on top of that, they had to learn that um, if you run on highest SMT no, no, uh, mode, that does not mean you got best performance, okay? Um, in um, differentiation to Intel, we have different modi. You can run a SMT1, which is pretty much non-SMT. <coughs> SMT2, so you can run two SMT threads uh, in parallel, SMT4 and SMT8, okay? And the sweet spot, of course, does not mean SMT8 is always the best choice. In their case, for example, they could get to performance improvement with this a uh, little bit twiggling in the code, actually, which was uh, in the, uh, around factor three. When we got to SMT8 mode uh, and tried that, actually, we dropped down again to something, something like 1.5, okay? So it's something you have to take into regard. Also, um, at the beginning, of course, um, we got some surprises since, um, uh, of course, you have to pay a little burden uh, in order to uh, keep the threads actually separate from one another. This means if you have a benchmark which is focused on single thread performance, uh, you may get a little bit surprised about that because, uh, I mean, of course, we have technology improvements and we also raise single thread performance. But in this case, let me do a simple example. You have uh, two threads, actually, and uh, each thread takes uh, one second, okay? So when you are in single thread mode, of course, the uh, uh, complete runtime is one plus one, this is two seconds, okay? Now you say, okay, great, I have a simultaneous multi-threading, I throw it in this mode. Um, you get to uh, a little bit burden, and uh, we say, okay, each thread now takes 1.2 seconds, okay? Um, so it's still better. I mean, you got from two seconds to 1.2 seconds, which is uh, uh, improvement. Now, if you have a benchmark which is focusing on single thread only, you get worse, okay? Because you got from one second to 1.2 seconds. So you have to be very careful also when you try to leverage a feature like that actually to exploit it in the right way, okay? And uh, I think this is also kind of uh, the pattern we see more and more. Uh, we need a stronger collaboration between software guys, hardware guys, uh, virtualization guys, actually, because the stack function is taking more and more um, focus in the complete performance evaluation and in the efficiency uh, evaluation, okay? Okay, so this one thing, of course, there are other features which maybe are a little bit easier to uh, exploit, for example, like um, SIMD engines. This is just vectorization of uh, floating point units and things like that. Uh, another very interesting area um, is the uh, field of hardware acceleration. This means uh, you really implement um, special function components. Um, uh, the reason why hardware acceleration has got a, a bigger hype within the last uh, five to ten years is uh, one part is uh, FPGA technology has uh, made good progress forward. And the other part is now that we have this big number of transistors available um, on the processor, we pull in more functions into the processor scope. Okay, this means uh, in the past we usually had uh, a proprietary uh, interface out of the processor into a I/O hub function, which was a separate chip. Um, meanwhile, we implement this chip directly into the processor and. Um, uh, are, uh, are uh, on the step actually to include that cache coherently to the rest of the caches. This means you got way, way faster um, I.O. attachments and you got way uh, smaller latencies and this means you can leverage these uh, uh, acceleration techniques uh, much more uh, efficiently than you could in the past, okay? Um, overall, I think um, there are different types of, of uh, accelerators which we um, distinguish in this uh, context. Um, accelerators in common is a big field. We also have on-processor development. This is also a trend, uh, on-processor uh, accelerator. This is also a trend we see. There we reserve some of the transistors actually and implement special functions. Um, you see that on the power, for example, for compression purposes or for encryption purposes, we have special acceleration engines actually which do that. 
This, uh, what I uh, want to uh, put a little bit light on here is specifically the area of GPU attachments. GPU uh, uh, graphical processors have a good ecosystem. This means there is a programming language uh, you can use and there is also uh, a more easier way actually to integrate that into your uh, operating system flow by having device drivers, all that stuff. Uh, so from that perspective, GPUs are um, very interesting right at the moment. Uh, for example, the Forschungszentrum Gülich uh, runs a huge uh, supercomputing project in the human brain space where human brain functions are simulated. They uh, um, do a, a very uh, sophisticated balancing between power 8 uh, compute power and GPU compute power for uh, uh, parallelization purposes. Since these uh, graphical processors, they are not quite that powerful as, for example, power 8 core, but of course their number is relatively high and they uh, do not consume too much power. Okay? So that's uh, a good thing. Uh, of course, you need some knowledge uh, how to, to integrate that into your flow. Um, the other very interesting part is the so-called FPGAs. FPGAs are special hardware which you can uh, program uh, in a certain language. Um, Altera has come up uh, with a language called OpenCL which from our perspective uh, is uh, um, very well suited to do um, quick and, 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 and fast, uh, quick and dirty, uh, I would say, um, prototype uh, development. If you want to use an FPGA in a product-like um, environment, it's a little bit um, more difficult because their OpenCL certainly is not the best choice because you don't get all the capabilities of the uh, FPGA. There you should really use languages like uh, VHDL or Verilog because they make it more efficient. And this of course means uh, then you need some experts. I mean for us as process developers it's not a big deal but uh, uh, for software development guys getting in that deep um, kind of hardware languages of course is a little bit more difficult. So from that perspective the uh, consumability of this is uh, certainly a little bit more complicated than with uh, GPUs, but uh, from an efficiency perspective, you can uh, accelerate uh, specific workloads factor 1000, for example, uh, for Monte Carlo simulation, we have seen effects like that in the high frequency trading stuff, um, but the effort of course also is relatively high. Okay, and then of course there is one, uh, there's some other stuff, uh, I don't want to go in too much detail. You can uh, use these fast interfaces for in-memory database processing, actually, uh, for example, using non-volatile uh, storage like flash um, instead of uh, DIMMs and, and stuff like that. And then uh, there is, uh, of course, a very interesting um, new area. I just uh, want to allude a little bit here, uh, but uh, say some more words uh, at the end. This is the area of neurosynaptic. This means there we use completely new um, processor architectures which don't run with uh, high um, uh, frequencies but uh, which are very close aligned to the human brain function and for that reason have uh, power efficiencies which are a factor 10,000 higher than with the usual von Neumann architecture. I will talk about that in a little bit uh, later on. Uh, but the idea here is also of course uh, to use this type of uh, hardware then for special uh, hardware acceleration purposes for special work, okay? Specifically pattern recognition in this case. Okay, so that's, uh, these are the, the sources of, these are some of the sources actually which you can use um, to gain more performance to resolve the uh, uh, Moore's law equation in, in, a, in a good way. Now, of course, in Power8, uh, just examples of that, uh, all of these features are implemented. I talked about the big caches. Um, I talked about the SMT. As I mentioned before, we have SMT248 mode. Um, we are just uh, rethinking the SMT8 right at the moment. We could not find a lot of uh, applications which really use SMT8, so maybe it's, it makes sense to stay somewhere at SMT4. Uh, we have a SIMD engine in, um, of course, we have extremely high memory bandwidth. Um, uh, in order to gain this memory bandwidth, actually, uh, we have built a special chip. Uh, it's up, up to 230 gigabyte per uh, second. I mean, of course, uh, talking about SAP HANA, for example, everyone sees that um, doing uh, most of the work uh, in, in directly in exchange between processor and memory is getting more and more uh, interesting, so for that reason we have implemented that. Um, and then um, what we have done on top of that, uh, we have optimized this 
direct PCI interface which gets out of the processor. Um, and we call that uh, coherent accelerator processor interface. We will uh, continue to improve that uh, in, the, in the future as we see accelerators getting more and more important. The background on that is this. Um, Usually when you run a PCI interface directly from the processor, you use a traditional I.O. protocol, which makes the thing um, a little bit slower and the latency a little bit higher because you don't have a feature like, for example, InfiniBand, uh, which is called RDMA. Um, you have more or less load store functions, okay? And uh, these load store functions um, do not allow to have a real uh, cache coherent uh, integration of these external components. Now, we have uh, integrated a, a, a protocol layer, uh, which uh, is a kind of a workaround uh, uh, around that. And this means uh, with this uh, coherent attached uh, uh, processor interface, you can now um, integrate uh, external components and have them cache coherently integrated into your overall workload. Okay? Uh, so this means you get something like uh, to two to three uh, latency improvements versus a regular, just uh, plain vanilla PCI attachment, which you have uh, in this PCI slots. Okay, and um, we have uh, come up with a Power8 Plus version. Uh, yeah, so uh, this copy interface uh, uh, has a, a lot of uh, advantages uh, in uh, uh, playing together with FPGA acceleration. In order to get the same uh, advantages also with uh, GPU acceleration, we have uh, implemented another uh, link, which is so-called NVLink, NV for NVIDIA. And um, this is, for example, one of the features which is massively used in this human brain project uh, uh, in the first instance of NVIDIA. Okay, so just uh, to show up uh, a little bit of differences. Now, when, you, when we compare that, as I mentioned before, um, um, First of all, I mean, I have a lot of respect for the Intel guys. I mean, they, they really do a good job. They really give us a hard time uh, to stay uh, uh, competitive. But I think what's important is um, we um, have a little bit different philosophy that, than Intel has. And uh, I want to use this chart and also look at the, the performance numbers to demonstrate that a little bit. Uh, what you clearly see is... Um, Intel uh, has more or less given up on uh, uh, frequency at something around 3.4 gigahertz. Um, uh, as you can see, this comes in a, something like 150 watt envelope, which is doable. Okay? And uh, we have a little bit different philosophy. We said, okay, uh, we are capable to build system designs because we have a lot of experience in the enterprise uh, 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 machines. Um, we go up to 250 watts, uh, we pay that but we go also up to five gigahertz, okay? So uh, you can uh, certainly resolve this equation in, in different ways. Um, uh, Intel is uh, doing that in this way, we do it in the other way. The reason why we can run this five gigahertz is uh, what we have seen before, uh, this deep trench um, capabilities, this deep trench features, which I brought uh, up in the context of caches. You can also use that for frequency decoupling or for circuit decoupling. This means if you really want to go up to five gigahertz, you have to uh, have a feature like that, otherwise you are not allowed to do so, okay? And uh, you also have to burn down your gate oxide stuff. Um, then you see uh, we have uh, different cache structures, uh, which are much bigger. We have higher memory bandwidth, actually. Uh, we have uh, addressable memory, which is much bigger, uh, in the range of uh, 16 terabyte, for example, for the E880 system. And uh, when you pull all this uh, together, and look at that more from a parameter um, uh, perspective, then RPE2 is uh, actually a relatively good benchmark. Uh, RPE2 uses um, kind of uh, empirical data and allows you to compare Intel uh, architecture to power architecture and also compare it to uh, 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 earlier generations. Um, what you see is Intel is running a strategy um, that they say our per core performance more or less stays the same. This is also now uh, in the Haswell Broadwell um, uh, transition uh, of their Xeon architecture. Uh, as you can see, they even go a little bit lower now at 2.2 gigahertz. We, uh, we with Power8, uh, we go up in uh, uh, per core performance. So uh, at the same time, of course, we are at somewhere at 3.5 gigahertz. And uh, when you remember the, the chart before, 
uh, the philosophy of Intel is to go towards a higher number of cores instead of uh, just uh, raising frequency. So uh, that, that's pretty much what I want to bring up here. It's it's different different approach. Um, and with this different approach, uh, you can see that uh, when you compare uh, benchmarks, with this different approach, you get results where for some of the benchmarks, which kind of reflect certain uh, workloads, um, you are more more or less, uh, you, you get a wash. But then for other specific workloads, you got um, performance uh, increase factor 2.5. Okay, and, and I think the important thing is um, you really have to um, uh, learn a little bit about Power 8 in order to figure actually which is the right workload to fit to this, uh, to this uh, engine. Okay, it's certainly not in that case that every engine, uh, that every workload is the right thing for this engine. Uh, it's, uh, you need to invest a little bit, but if you find a, a workload which fits to that, you of course can get to way higher efficiencies uh, uh, than uh, with the other hardware, for example. So that's what I want to bring up a little bit today. So now, um, looking forward, um, it's um, getting more obvious that, and you heard, uh, I talked a lot about cache sizes and uh, frequency and all that stuff. Um, uh, going even further actually out uh, in the, into the future, I think, uh, this discussion uh, will still be um, vital, but there will be more and more other areas which uh, will get more uh, uh, attention, um, specifically in the microarchitecture area. Since, uh, I mean, what we think uh, about right at the moment is um, to come up with more flexible structures. Actually, you see the roadmap here. Uh, we have also new semiconductor technologies, but I think the real discussion right at the moment is about uh, can we come up with uh, flexible core designs, which, uh, for example, allow you to combine um, uh, cores in a, in a kind of modular uh, way? Because what I described before, uh, in a certain sense, you have uh, kind of resources um, which you can share on a processor. And the question, of, of course, is how efficiently can you uh, balance these re resources against, against each other? And the idea is uh, um, to build kind of... Um, modular cores, which allow you to run in a kind of one to four mode. So you have um, uh, either one smaller uh, component, actually, which does not get too many resources, but you can combine it with other cores, for example, pull it together as a four core uh, unicore, which then has a higher number of resources. Or you can, uh, for example, use just three of these uh, minor cores and combine it with a sp uh, special uh, purpose engine, like an accelerator or stuff like that. So these are the, uh, the uh, discussions which we have, which we see right at the moment for future products. Um, of course, we are, um, right at the moment, we are working on the Power 9, uh, which is a 14 nanometer chip. Um, my team, fortunately, uh, released the first uh, uh, release to the FAB, uh, to Global Foundry, um, last week. Um, and. Uh, this means uh, within the next uh, three months, we will get the first hardware and then we get into a mighty test cycle actually. Um, and so pretty much, I think uh, in the 2017 timeframe, we then we'll see the first Power9 chips. And Power9 will already realize some of these ideas which I just alluded to, okay? So, and uh, going further out then, of course, um, uh, what we call Power10, uh, um, there are already plans actually, concepts uh, started. Um, which then will go even more uh, intensively into that direction. Okay. Um, maybe just to give you a little bit of impression about such a, a project, usually it takes something like four to five years to, to uh, develop a process like that okay, uh, before you get to market. This means you start with a concept phase, uh, for example, for Power 10, which then will show up somewhere around 2020. We are in concept phase right at the moment. Uh, after, and this takes something it depends a little bit on uh, how fast actually you can um, integrate all the various characters who have their opinion actually uh, what the processes should look like. Uh, after that, then you go into high level design, you really break it down to is this a 20 core design or is this a 24 core design, things like that. Then you get into implementation, you uh, uh, write all the logic design which takes something like half a year and then 
somewhere around um, um, 18 months before you can go to market, you really uh, send the design data into the fab. And at the fab, of course, you have a pretty uh, complicated process, actually. They build masks, they set up all the lithography uh, 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 environment, um, they run certain tests uh, in order to prove if the technology really uh, is capable to um, realize your chip in the end. And then uh, uh, you get back the first hardware, um, you do the initial testing, which takes something like uh, three to four months, and then you have one other shot before you um, go into the uh, GA, where actually where you can fix all the bugs uh, you still find in such a process. So this means you always have a very long lead time until you get into the market, and this means right at the moment, of course, we run with Power 8, Power 9 is in the pipe, actually, and Power 10, of course, is in Ken's concept right at the moment, just to give you a little uh, impression about that. Okay, so um, now we talked a lot about technology, technical stuff, um, but besides that, um, there is one other thing which is very important, uh, very, very important trend. What we see more and more is um, while we have developed a lot of proprietary stuff over the last 20, 30, 40 years, uh, within the last 10 years, we see a clear trend towards openness, okay? And uh, of course, uh, when you say, when I say last 10 years, uh, guys like you, you would laugh and say, well, already in the 80s we saw Linux, but for the hardware, this is a little bit different. Hardware had been uh, kind of closed systems. I mean, um, there had been not uh, too much uh, cooperation between uh, teams. There had been some competing parties, but uh, it was more difficult to cooperate. Um, now, as you have seen before, if you really want to realize such more solution-like uh, uh, systems, which, for example, leverage uh, accelerators, then um, I think the equation uh, that this is done by one company is getting more and more difficult. This is what we realized for, for a very long time. And uh, the consequence, actually, um, is that we say, well, similar to what we see, have seen, actually, with Linux, um, uh, this could be also done in the, uh, in the hardware space. Uh, you just uh, have to demonstrate the willingness to open up your architecture, actually, and uh, maybe also come up with a foundation which allows you to uh, strongly cooperate with other partners. And this is pretty much what happened uh, in 2013 uh, when we and other uh, companies uh, like Mellanox and like Google and like uh, NVIDIA uh, came up with the Open Power Foundation. Uh, the Open Power Foundation gives a completely new, uh, flexible uh, framework uh, which allows you to build hardware in a totally different way than you have done in the past. And it's not only about hardware, it's also about operating systems, virtualization, yada, 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 applications, okay? Now, um, the, the background story on that is the following. Um, maybe you remember uh, some way, uh, somewhere back, uh, in 2012, we, um, IBM had run this uh, Jeopardy game with uh, our Watson um, software. Uh, I think this was uh, a little bit of a step into a new era. We had the Deep Blue, uh, which was playing chess, okay, and where we could uh, uh, demonstrate uh, some human uh, capabilities of such a machine, and I think Jeopardy was uh, a step forward. And of course, when we, when we run that on, on uh, the US TV, uh, there was a company uh, called Google, which was pretty uh, interested in um, what technology this is. Uh, since uh, overall, when we uh, look into the future, I think this, uh, what we call cognitive approaches and all that is getting more and more interesting, specifically in the research area. And of course, they also understood um, that uh, this uh, machine human interface, specifically in, in this case of Watson, uh, was solved in a, in a pretty uh, impressive way. And so they, they contacted us and asked, well, what technology is that? And in this uh, discussion, they, they also learned that, for example, the Watson, Watson technology is completely realized in, in power technology. And uh, with this uh, cooperation, actually, which we started with them, um, they came up with some ideas uh, which were very, were very typical for us, uh, for these new kids on the block like Google, like Amazon, like, like Rackspace, like Facebook, which out of the sudden 
um, had been yeah uh, very well um, uh, suited players in the in the IT landscape, and uh, their idea was um, pretty much to tell us, well, look, um, we have shifted the paradigm. We will not buy any boxes from you as uh, I don't know Daimler or Deutsche Bank or uh, here in the in the German space will do, uh, since we build our systems ourselves. Okay, but uh, we can of course. Uh, work together, we are very interested in your technology, but this would really mean you have to come up with a legal foundation which allows us to use your technology in the same context as we can do it, for example, with Intel. And our response was, okay, we got the message and we will do that and then we will go even one step further. We will also um, give the, uh, the, the possibility to open up our complete uh, microarchitecture of the process. And um, obviously this was uh, uh, the right uh, direction we are hitting. This brought us into a POC together with Google, and uh, this means, meanwhile, a uh, big part of their search engine is not running on Intel x86 anymore, but is running on power technology. But on top of that, uh, there was a lot of notion, of course, about this new approach. And um, now, meanwhile, we also have uh, some technology partnerships uh, with companies, specifically in the Chinese space, which come up with their own ideas on how to build a processor based on Power8 technology. This means we have uh, one um, partner right at the moment, it's uh, Shisu PowerCore, a Chinese company. They have built their own Power8 um, uh, pro uh, processor chip. Uh, background on that, of course, also was a little bit about the NSA discussion. They changed the crypto engine, they changed some of the floating point stuff into that, and they come up with a now more Chinese power flavored actually power eight processor. And on top of that, of course, they also start to operate in this open power context and build their own systems with new companies like Neucloud, like uh, Moon. Um, so we see a, a completely open new approach actually in, to come up with a new server portfolio in a certain sense, which of course for the architecture um, brings in a lot of um, benefits since the more vital actually we get into that space, the more uh, we can uh, leverage all the, the, the technologies which are in, in place, we can get more experience about that. Uh, the ecosystem system is growing by that, so very interesting to watch right at the moment. So that's the background actually, uh, on, and the idea about uh, open power. Now of course, as I said, Google and uh, Facebook Rackspace are companies which are uh, uh, dealing with that uh, with these new capabilities um, in a very interesting way. Um, that just uh, for all of you, I, I meanwhile we are something like more than 200 members um, all over the world actually, um, technology companies, <coughs> integration companies, uh, operating system companies, software companies, uh, you call it, so very interesting to watch. Um, interesting approach here, there are other open uh, approaches like, for example, the Open Compute project, which was initiated by Facebook. This is more on the system integration side. This means they say, well, we have a very good network worldwide, uh, a lot of users. Why shouldn't we um, just put a spec into the web, actually, and ask uh, if someone is interested in building a computer, uh, actually, on uh, based on that spec? Uh, that's what they started with Open Compute. Uh, now this is combined with Open Power. Um, they build a, a specific mezzanine um, system actually just for their purposes and I think it's very interesting to see here how these two things, how these two open movements come together. Uh, same here uh, between Google and uh, Rackspace, a uh, new thing for us actually is uh, that they already um, plan for uh, Power9 CPUs. Power9 so far is not part of the open power uh, foundation but as you can see as there is so much interest, I mean this is, will be one of the next steps that we do the uh, announcements also from the IBM side. And uh, so there are a lot of interest actually in order to use that. Okay, so that's uh, the open power part which allows more flexibility, which allows new business models, which allows completely new flexible system designs, uh, which then are in better shape actually also to leverage all the uh, capabilities such a platform actually can deliver. Um, the other thing I mentioned before is also interesting to watch. Uh, it's not so much uh, about uh, power only, but um, you saw uh, we had this neurosynaptic chip. Um, 
I mean, one big trend we see right at the moment now, more from our IBM research perspective, is that um, this uh, extremely uh, high uh, increase of, of, of this exp exponential growth of data, uh, when you look a little bit closer, actually, this is, um, you have to distinguish between the traditional IT, uh, and I think um, uh, there is some linear growth, uh, but if you look at exponent exponential growth, you mainly see that the data which are really growing faster are what we call data at the edge. This means uh, these are data produced by cameras, by sensors uh, in the uh, Internet of Things uh, uh, context, uh, smartphones, and, and, and. And um, of course, this uh, comes uh, defines a little bit different equation, since um, in order to use this data, and uh, obviously some uh, very popular players use this very efficiently, you have a little bit different paradigms uh, than uh, in the past. Um, most of these data are not used so far. One of the reasons is um, that they are very transient. This means they lose meaning within seconds or so. Um, the other part is that you don't have the bandwidth actually to get them into a cloud environment. Uh, and this means you really have to process them at the edge if you really want to use them. Okay? And this brings us uh, to uh, a field which is very interesting right at the moment uh, to watch more from a research perspective. Um, uh, what we call brain-inspired systems. Um, there, you totally go away from a from, from, from Neumann architecture. You build uh, many core chips, actually, and the cores, uh, the, the small little cores, are not designed like uh, floating point units or anything else. Uh, they are really directly aligned to the human brain function. This means you have uh, neuron functions and synapse functions uh, realized in a um, network. I mean, there had been a trend in the 80s, uh, neural networks. This is similar to that. But now you have neural networks, actually, which are realized in a hardware structure and which come up with a way, number, way higher number, actually, of neurons. Okay? Um, there's a lot of uh, research done around that. Um, uh, in addition to that, there is this, uh, uh, a lot of uh, discussion uh, about machine intelligence in common right at the moment. So this means how can we get to systems which uh, are capable to learn instead of being programmed, huh? um, which is also uh, a very interesting field. And uh, now for this specific case, for the neurosynaptic space, uh, IBM has built a chip, um, so-called uh, True North architecture, um, very high number of transistors. I mean, you can run such a chip uh, for certain um, workloads with an inefficiency raise in the area of something like a thousand, specifically when you do pattern recognition stuff. And at the same time, you just consume something like a factor of 10,000 less uh, power. This means you can uh, use a chip like that in a, for example, in a smartphone and run it with a smartphone battery, battery for something like a week uh, without having any problems. And for us, of course, the big question now is uh, how do we get to programming models actually in order to utilize it in the best way? How do these self-learning mechanisms look like actually to transport uh, as a way a little bit from, from just uh, uh, real programming? Um, at the moment, I think this is... Uh, very much focused on research activities, but I think in the next 10 to 15 years, this will be very interesting to watch since from a, from a um, vision perspective, this could have same capabilities as the com a combination between von Neumann architecture with CMOS technology. The good thing is uh, the CMOS technology is already there, so we don't have to invest into that. This is all about architecture and understanding how the brain function looks like, okay? So just uh, wanted to put that on the table at the end, but that's pretty much what I tried to share today or wanted to share today with you on hardware. Are there any questions? No, okay, thank you very much.